Hey everyone. Did, did you see all the, the tomatoes we have up out there? Did you, did you get to taste any of them? Not yet, or some of them? Well, we've got various ones that are cherry round, like this. And then we've got one that is cherry plum, like this. And um, for the ones of you who have tasted them, do you remember if you preferred the cherry round or the cherry plum? Cherry round, yeah. All right. Well, for the rest of you, let's uh, let, let's figure it out when uh, when we break up for the day here. Um, personally, for me, this cherry plum is is the best one. I really like this flavor. It's got, for me, the best flavor phenotype that you can get from a, from a tomato. But how do we get such a phenotype? A phenotype is driven by two major factors. The first one is the environment. You can think of weather, right? And that is a huge part of the environment. But these days, and especially for crops like these tomatoes that are grown in high-tech glasshouses, a grower can really control the environment. We've got great uh, talks from Seed Valley about this, of course, as well, and how this environment can be manipulated and even can, uh, can leverage le uh, digital twins to, to fine tune exactly the right environment to get perfectly tasting tomatoes that you want. The second factor is what's packed into every seed, and that's the, the genetics, right? Genetics plus environment gives your phenotype. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. I'm a geneticist, and I'm gonna talk about how the world of genetics is changing thanks to big data. And I'm really excited about this journey, and that's what I hope to convey. So, what do I do as a geneticist? Well, I try and identify the parts of the genome that are really important to drive a certain phenotype. So, for example, if we're trying to improve, fa improve flavor, I need to find the parts of the genome that our breeding teams can follow specifically and they can select for so that we enrich for good genetics for flavor. And so we are scientists, we perform experiments, we generate data and we perform analysis. In this case, we will take a tomato plant that tastes really good and cross it to a tomato plant that, that doesn't quite taste as good. And when we cross these two plants together, we mix their genomes, we recombine their genomes. So then if we take their offspring, each offspring has a different combination of the two parent genomes, right? We've mixed this all up. And then we can start generating data. So we first make one data set of phenotypes. We go ahead and we phenotype for flavor, so maybe tasting tomatoes from each plant and say, good flavor, bad flavor. And then we've got an amazing data set, right? We've got a great phenotype data set now, and that's pretty cool. But we need another data set to do our analysis, and that's the genotypes. So we use molecular tools to identify for every plant which parts of the genomes they inherited from the good tasting plant and which part they inherited from the bad tasting plant. We've got our genotype data set. And then here comes what I find the fun part. This is the analysis. This is when we get insights. And that's the marriage of those two data sets, finding the association, the relationship between phenotype and genotype. Which plants that tasted good always had a specific part of the good tasting plant genome, right? If you can, through process of elimination across the genome, find the parts that are consistently in the good tasting plants, you can have a pretty high confidence that this is actually really good genetics for flavor. And then you can run off to the breeding teams and say, hey, let's, let's use some markers and follow this within our breeding program to enrich it and make sure we can get the flavor even better. This is really fun work, I find. I really like getting these insights. Um, but you know, if we, if we look at what we actually need to get right in our varieties, all the phenotypes, we've got a lot of work. You think about it, a, a grower, a plant raiser will, will buy seeds from us, from a variety. 
And that variety, it has to have the genetics to, to germinate really well. It has to have the genetics to, to grow big and strong. It has to have the genetics to withstand biotic stress, like attack from viruses. And it's got to have the genetics to withstand abiotic stress, like, like high heats or cold nights. And it has to have the genetics to produce a huge amount of yield so the grower can make as much money as possible from that crop. But to save as much money, it has to have the genetics to make that yield pretty easy to harvest, to be labor friendly. It also should have the genetics to withstand shipping so that when it goes to the supermarket or markets, and this could be an international journey, that those fruits still look good. And when you and I go to that supermarket and we see those delicious fruits, we say, that looks really good, that looks fresh, I'm gonna take that home. And when you take it home and you taste it, you think, gosh, that is delicious, I'm gonna buy that again, right? And that's just, that's just a short list of the genetics and the phenotypes we need to get right for every variety. So if people like me are gonna make our, our crosses and generate our own data every time we want to get some genetics right, well, that's a lot of work and that's what we do, but I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm a bit lazy and when I think, I really like the analysis, but I know there's a lot more data being generated and is it not a waste of time if I'm always just working with my data and people like me are always just working with our, data, our own data? Can't we use all the data? Can't we get insights there? Can't we learn more? And, and I, I, I think this is the truth. I think this is where we're going. And this has to do with um, you know, the revolution of big data. And it even allows me you know, to kind of to have sort of future visions of what my job will look like in the future, where I'm not every time thinking, what are the best genetics for this phenotype that I can recommend to a breeder, but that I can think of it differently, that I can start thinking, hey, the, the genome is made out of uh, tens of thousands of genes, right? Every gene can have different versions. This is, this is what gives phenotypic diversity, right? Different versions of genes or alleles. So these are the genetic building blocks that make up different phenotypes. And wouldn't it be cool if in the future, instead of saying, yes, yeah, select a bit of this for that phenotype, select a bit of that for that phenotype, I could be able to say, hey, let's design some genomes and say, for all the phenotypes for these environments, these are the different combinations of alleles we need to put together to get there. A totally different world, and, and it might sound super futuristic, or maybe not, I don't know what you guys think, but uh, <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, it sounds uh, really exciting. And I think we're in a world where we can, we can get to, um, to, to this way of thinking because of three main reasons around, um, around the world of big data that I'll talk about now briefly, and then I'll show you some examples uh, as, as, to, uh, as to what I mean specifically. So, firstly, big data is not just lots more of what we're doing. I think we've seen in some other talks in uh, Seed Valley is that, for example, when it comes to phenotypes, it's not just good plant, bad plant anymore. We've got images, we've got sensors telling you the size, the shape, the color of plants across its whole growth cycle and measurements and biochemistry of fruits. There's so many different layers of, of phenotypic data that we have these days. It's, um, it's amazing that it's, it's not just lots more per plant, but it's a lot more in a, in a real depth. When it comes to environments, we also have way more data. It's not just that was winter or that was summer. No, every day we know the weather, we know the exact temperature for that trial uh, uh, during day and night, soil moisture, all these types of environmental data we know. We also know how the crop was treated by a farmer, whether it was sprayed because there was, a, there was, um, there was some fungus. And then, and then genotypes as well. It's amazing when we used to say, well, there's a bit of, of, this, of, of these genetics in that plant. Now we know the complete sequence pretty much of of most of our crops, and then to a molecular level, we know exactly how different the genetic combinations are of each plant. 
We even know things about the, the structural variation, how genes maybe are in different orders sometimes. We know about the epigenome. We know so much about the genetics. So that's my first point. There, there's a lot more data, and it's of really high quality. But my second point is the connectedness between the data. My, my example at the beginning of how, um, how I used phenotypic and genotypic data to get insights, you know, that's the power of data, when you can connect different data sets together. And that's what, uh, thanks to some great discipline, is possible now. So when you have all this uh, high resolution data that you can all connect it to each other, is when you start really gaining a lot of power and start making insights like you couldn't before at a scale you couldn't before. And, I, and, the, and the, the examples will maybe sort of help crystallize this a bit, but I first want to talk about the third, data, um, the third point, which maybe is the most important one as to why I'm excited and, um, and hope to sort of uh, bring your excitement too, and that's, that's the accessibility of data. I think, I think in, the, in the past, you really had to be um, you know, a really, really good coder and really understand where data was, what sort of APIs you had to ping to get certain data sets, get them together, and then probably have to connect them yourself. But, but nowadays, we've just got great infrastructure and tools for, for people like me who, you know, I'm, I'm not a data scientist, but I can now ask questions and get the answers without going through a network of people to do the analysis for me. I find that so exciting. So this means when you have high quality, connected and accessible data, that for example, um, a breeder can walk through, through their trial and, and look, at a, look at a plot, look at a plant, and pull out lots of data on that, right? We know the exact GPS coordinates, so we know all the weather, everything that's happened to that plant for its whole growth season, all the phenotypic data that's been uh, taken from that plant during that time, everything about its ge genetics. And if that variety was trialed elsewhere, we know all that data too. We can compare it. We can say, hey, compared to last year or compared into Australia, this one's doing really well this time. Interesting. But I think my, my second example is more about you know where I see this world going and what interests me as a geneticist is that you can take any given gene and say, hey, for this gene, we've got two alleles, two versions, A and B. Which is best? Which should we be recommending for, for breeders? Well, we can now very quickly ask a question saying, OK, in what plants did version A of this gene ever exist? And in what environments was, was it? And what phenotypes did it have? And the same question for version B. So quickly, sort of side by side, you can start saying, was one of these versions better overall? Was one of these versions better at delivering tasty tomatoes at a high yield, tolerant against disease, all of that? Are their versions good for an ultimate product uh, profile? And, and this is, I think, the... Um, the age we're getting to, or, and, and we already are actually. You know, we can make these insights. It's, it's about putting it all together and, and, uh, and being able to, uh, yeah, d design genomes, which is, you know, the, um, the difference that I'm experiencing is, you know, we, we work towards in breeding, selecting the best, or finding how can we find tools to be able to say this is going to be the winner, or this is the winner of all the different variation we've made, to designing the best to being super intentional about saying, this is what we need now, this is what we need in the future, let's build that. So that's how I'm excited for the sector, for agriculture in big data, especially when it comes to genetics. And, and I want to kind of you know, close with why, why I think it's maybe exciting for, uh, for you all. I know a lot of you have um, uh, a bioinformatics um, uh, or, or, or training for bioinformatics and, uh, and data science, and that is so valuable. We need a lot more of you. And I'm also talking now for those of you who, who maybe don't quite feel in that part of, um, uh, of agriculture is what interests you as much, um, to know that big data is empowering for you as well. So the analogy I want to close with is 
um, the evolution of the internet. When, when we first started getting the internet and it was really popular, it was version like web 1.0. Uh, and, and it was really exciting because you could, you could go on, you could log in and ask Jeeves. You, you wouldn't Google at the time, you would ask Jeeves any question and you could find websites with lots of information on, on whatever uh, you wanted. And that was so empowering. We suddenly could get so much information, we could download. But if we wanted to contribute to the internet, if we wanted to make our own websites saying you know, what our hobbies were or what our research was, we had to either buy a really thick book on how to code HTML, learn it, go to university for it, or pay someone to, to, write, um, to write your websites for you. And, and so that became you know, kind of a bottleneck in creativity. Whereas as Web 2.0 came about, at a click of a button, we can now make our own websites for free even. You can make a pretty cool looking website. You can upload videos, any sort of images, any sort of creativity you want onto, onto the internet now because it's so simple to do. That, that bottleneck, that barrier is gone and it unleashes an incredible amount of creativity, some better than other, but but an incredible amount. And this is what I really hope for plant breeding and for geneticists, that we don't always feel, hey, if I've got to work with big data, I've got to be able to have these specific tools. I think, no, we need the diversity of many minds coming together to fix tomorrow's uh, problems and today's problems. And we don't need to think anymore that uh, we need very specific skill sets to overcome that barrier. Thank you.